perfume. Aren't we glad? Aren't we ha- glad that we have perfume? Uh, now, for us, I don't know, Bonnie's not here right now, so I'll just tell you, the smell she likes best is shaving cream. So when I shave, I just wipe my face off with a dry rag and leave it there, and she loves my smell. Now, having said that, I love her smell. Sometimes even when she's not home, I'll spray her perfume in, in the room or on the pillow, and I just I enjoy smell. But I take a shower every day, almost every day. They didn't. In the Bible times, they didn't. It was a rare thing for them to take a bath. They didn't have showers. And so they used perfume. Also, they didn't have our, they didn't have our funeral procedures. Uh, so they had ways of, of covering the smell also of a decaying body. That's what we're talking about here this morning. I know it sounds strange, but uh, they used odor and smell and perfume a lot back then only because it was just convenient. And so I want to talk about Mary's perfume. And if you turn with me to John chapter 12 in your Bibles, I'd like for you to follow along. Uh, and I, want, I appreciate those of you who are at home. If you would, I picture you at home uh, on your couch at your kitchen table with your Bible open following along. And uh, someone could turn my monitor on. That might help. So, all right. John chapter 12. Before we begin, let's go to the, the, the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, O oh God, with all my heart, I pray, dear Lord, that you will use this message to touch other people's hearts. Hearts, Lord, that are hearts that need to be perfumed. They need, Lord, to be taken care of better. Lord, they need help to find joy in their life. Thank you again, Lord, for your greatness and your wonderfulness, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this story that Mary's act of service could withstand 2,000 years. Ask you, Lord, to bless this. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Then, six days before the Passover, you Bible scholars, that at least is Friday evening, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany. Now, Bethany was a town very close to Jerusalem up in the hills. And Lazarus was recently, six months before, raised from the dead. Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper. And Martha... Lazarus's oldest sister served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, and anointing the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair. Again, Bible scholars, she's already done this once. And, and the first time she did it, she, she did it and what put her on his head and his feet. We can't imagine, maybe some of you can, the odor of feet that go unwashed, that are walking on dirt paths where animals have also been walking. So probably the people's feet were, were very, very nasty. She comes and she, matter of fact, she doesn't mind touching his feet with, with her perfume. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Verse 4, but one of his disciples, of course, Judas, Simon's son, who would betray him, not too long after that, a week later, who would betray him, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii, which is a year's wages a year's average wages for a working person. 
Why wasn't it sold and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And he had the money box, and he used it to take what was put in it. Jesus knew, by the way. Sounds like the disciples all knew. But Jesus allowed it because he was a thief. Verse 7, Jesus said, after, after Judas had made such a stink, Jesus said, verse 7, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you will, you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Me on earth, to them, those, these disciples, uh, you, don't, you won't always have me. We need to understand, this is something for us to remember to appreciate one another. Don't take any day for granted. We never know when it might be our last. Now, born again believers, born again families, if it's our last on earth, it'll be our first in heaven together, which brings me joy in my heart. I wanted to point out to you three things about our future, your future in heaven. Your future in heaven, they're made known here in these first three verses. First is that in Lazarus, sitting at the table with Christ, we learn of both our future position and our portion to be where Christ is. In John 14, 3, just a little later that week, he says, that where I, that where I am, there you may be also. That where I am, there you may be also. We need, we need to remember that in our hearts and our minds, that this isn't all there is. And what you're going through is going to pass. Sometimes we take baby steps to get past it, and sometimes we take giant steps to get past it. But this isn't all there is, and this is going to pass whatever you're going through. Huh. To share with Christ his inherited reward will be our portion, our inheritance and how wonderfully this comes out here they made him a supper Lazarus was one of them who had died and been brought back four days later and now Lazarus is eaten with them as well I said I saw three things in those first three verses the second one is that Martha served now, we, we remember that there was Lazarus, there was Mary and Martha, and previously, approximately a year later, before, a year before, Martha is all cumbered, Jesus says. Martha, 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 you're all cumbered about the work. Mary, who was sitting at his feet, if there'd been Bibles at that time, Bible open, right at his feet, learning from what? learning from what Jesus was saying, wanting to soak up every, every word that Jesus was, would say. These are the same people here, Mary and, and Martha. And it still says Martha served, but she didn't complain this time. We can serve the Lord with our gifts and abilities, but complaining takes away the blessings. No, no, you need to hear that. Complaining takes away the blessings. Be careful when you're serving the Lord. Do it as un when you're serving, even the hard things. Do it as unto the Lord. Martha served. As to our future work in the endless ages yet to come, the Bible says very little, yet this we do know. Revelation 23, 11, 22, 3, his servants shall serve him. It says, his servants shall serve. There shall be no more curse, no more cancer, no more sickness. Praise God, no more COVID of any kind. There'll be no sadness in heaven. All tears will be wiped away permanently. And then it, it ends that 
that those verses with his servants shall serve him. I love that. I said I had three things. Finally, Mary's, I wanted you to notice Mary's loving devotion. We behold the worship which we shall then give unto him by Mary's self-sacrificingness. Finally, Mary's loving devotion. Listen, don't take for granted the worship service, the singing of praises to God. Don't take that for granted. Don't just let it be every day. These are moments that we are to be worshiping God Almighty. Mary had a loving devotion. We, I, I want to talk about Martha again. In verse 2, it simply says, Martha served. What I also notice is, is that she served, and this time she didn't complain. She ministered unto the Lord with her gifts and abilities, which happened to be in the kitchen, at the table. She served the Lord. Now, Mary does it differently. We don't all serve the Lord in the same way. We all have different abilities and gifts and, and uh, ministries in our lives. And we're not to judge. Why, why don't everybody else do it my way? Because we're different. And you need to find your niche, your service, your gifts, and serve the Lord without, without complaining or judging others as well. Martha served. She herself waited on, table, on the table. Be, because of her great respect to Jesus, she served. She didn't mind at all doing the hard physical labor. Though a person of her quality, she did not think it below herself to serve, to serve when Christ sat at her table. We should never think it a dishonor to us to stoop to any service, manual service, whereby Christ may be honored. Christ had formerly reproved Martha for being troubled with much serving. But she did not therefore stop serving, as some do. They, some people stop with hurt feelings. Some people stop with pride. Some people stop with jealousies. But better to be a waiter at Christ's table than a guest at the table of a prince. I found that quote some time ago and I, I really, really enjoyed it, ministered to me. That was about Martha. She learned her lesson and she served the Lord with gladness. She did her thing, what her thing was with gladness. And if you, if you recall, just six months earlier, Lazarus had died. And Jesus waited four days before he, he came. And now listen. Not everybody grieves the same way. Mary's back at home grieving quietly, not talking to anybody, while Martha's out and about with, with the friends who are there grieving with her. So uh, I point that out to you because Mary and Martha are totally different personalities, totally different people, but they ministered unto the Lord. We learn from Mary that the value of her ointment was a whole year's wages of a laboring person. Back in Matthew 20, verse 2. And let it be carefully noted that this devotion of Mary was prompted by no sudden impulse. It said, against the day of my burying hath she kept this, John 12, 7. The word kept she diligently preserved, she planned it out, she thought it out. It is possible she used the same box with ointment in it, not emptying it the first time on his head and his feet, the second time on his, on his feet. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. So it wasn't an impulse, it was planned. When she heard that Jesus was coming, 
She got the box out. She got ready to anoint him for death. Doubtless Mary intended this as a token of her love, her love to Christ. There is no doubt that Mary loved him with all her heart. Loved him with all her heart. She had real tokens of her love that she and her family gave. I, evidently, I'm going to be staying at an Airbnb. I don't know what that is. Uh, I don't want to say this too loud. My, uh, my mother might be listening there in Portland area. But uh, she's going to have her 90th. And even if she hears me, she won't remember tomorrow, so we're safe. But uh, Bethany was the first Airbnb. Anytime Jesus and the disciples were going to Jerusalem, they, they were taking the river route, they would pass through Bethany and even stop for a meal or stop for, uh, for a night. Uh, so it, it was their first bed and breakfast. Her love to Christ appears to have been three things. I want to point this out to you. First of all, her love appears to be a generous love. A generous love. Those who love Christ truly love Him so much better than anything in this world. They have no minimum love. They have maximum love. Some people give minimal all that they barely have to do. And there's no doubt Mary had a generous love, which was maximum love, maximal love. So I point that out to you. Look at your love for Christ. Is it just barely what I have to do? Okay, okay. What do I have to do to keep this relationship? Some people do. No, give everything. Give your all. She had a humbling love. She not only gave her ointment to Christ, but with her own hands poured it upon him, working it into the cracks of his toes. And it's an uh, amazing act of, of love that she gave there. Usually, in any situation, the lowest of the lowest slaves or servants in the house are the ones that would wash feet or anoint feet. Mary was not the lowest. She was one of the ladies of the house and she gave her most. Hmm. She could have ordered another servant to do it, but she wanted to do it because it was to Christ. It was for Christ. And the third love is a believing love. There was a faith working by this love. Faith in Jesus Christ the anointed, who was both priest and king. The, trying to point out to you, let us pour on him the ointment of our best affections, not our least, our best affections, above all other things, but by consenting Christ as our God, our king, who we should obey and submit to, obeying his plan for our lives. True love. True love does not spare expense. So it does not spare in pains. And it is considering what Christ has done and suffered for us. We are, we are very ungrateful if we think any service is too hard to let someone else do it, too low, any service too low to stoop to whereby he may be really glorified. Again, I say this as a help. No, I'll say this as a personal testimony for me. What works for me when I have to do something I don't want to do? When I have to do something I don't want to do, something gears up in me and I remember the missionary lady who sent her children home because there was so, so much turmoil in her country. I believe it was India or something. But 
she sent her children home saying, Lord, I do this for you. There are some very hard things that we have to do. What works for me is when I say, Lord, I do this for you. I don't want to do it, but Lord, I do this for you. That could be even with forgiveness. Lord, I forgive him or her for your, for you, for your sake. The result of Mary's worshipful act, first of all, the filling of the house with a pleasant odor of ointment shows us that those who worship Christ in their hearts and houses bring a sweet odor into them. Christ's presence brings with it an ointment and perfume which rejoice the heart. Honors done to Christ are comforts to all his friends and followers. They are to God and good men an offering of sweet-smelling savor. Worshipful, sacrificial acts are remembered for eternity. The youth group had an all-nighter. I'm so glad I didn't have to be there. Having been a youth pastor for so long, it was the all-nighters. It was easy when I was 32. But when I was in my 40s, it got so hard. It took me days to recuperate. And I'm sure the youth spent four hours catching up, but the workers are probably still down. But that's a sacrificial act, and we never know. So many good things happen from an all-nighter or a camp. And I, I just point that out to you because uh, worshipful, sacrificial acts are remembered for eternity. Mary did this thing 2,000 years ago. It's remembered and ministers to us for eternity. Just a quick word about Judas. The person that complained was Judas, one of his disciples but not one of their nature, but only one of their number. It is possible for the worst of men to lurk under the disguise of the, of the best. And there are many who pretend to have Christ as Savior, but are really works, wolves in sheep's clothing. Calling him their Lord. He will say, I never knew you, depart from me. Be careful. Be careful with that. I wanted you to note a coldness of love to Christ and Judas. A secret contempt for serious Christianity. When they appear as professors of religion, they are sad examples of a final apostasy in a one-world global society. What was it? Why was it not given to the poor? To which is an easy answer, because it was better given upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Proud men think all ill-advised who do not advise with them. Why didn't Mary come to me, the, the treasurer, I could have used that money. I could have talked that money. I could have talked that money out of her and maybe had some of it. Proud men like Judas think all are ill-advised who do not advise with them. Wow. I I ask you as just a part of our morning to remember, to remember our paper mill people in prayer. Those who won't have a job, in, a job in four to six weeks. And uh, please remember them. Keep them in your prayers. And I, I, I think of that because you wonder, you wonder how much those in upper up, the upper up offices, how much they knew and how much advice they were able to give. But please keep 
those people in your prayers. They have a lot of decisions and maybe sacrifices to make. Speaking of proud people, what about those Pharisees? The Pharisees were at this meal. They came to trick Jesus, and then we find out something more about them. We find out something more. In 12, 9, John 12, 9, now a great many of the Jews, much people of the Jews, therefore knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priest consulted that they might put Lazarus, Lazarus to death. Because on account of him, many of the Jews went away, believed in him. How audacious. How audacious for, here's a man, Jesus, that raised another man, Lazarus, from the dead, after he'd been dead four days, and all they want to do is put them both to death. That's amazing, amazing. John's gospel didn't come out until Lazarus had died. He didn't put, they, this didn't go out because he didn't want the Jews to be able to find, find Lazarus. Amazing, the audaciousness to me. They, were gonna, they wanted to put Lazarus and Jesus to death. How foolish. How unreasonable this day's vote was that Lazarus must also be put to death. They took counsel and they said, yeah, yeah, somebody came up with the idea, but that we got to put Lazarus to death too. Too many people are believing in the man that raised him from the dead. They had so much pride that in order for their everyday religious life entitlement, they had to get rid of anything that didn't agree with their doctrine, their testimony. Wow, how foolish. Lazarus must be put to death. This is an instance of the most terrible rage there could be. If they had feared God, they would not have done such an act of defiance to him. God will have Lazarus to live by miracle or die by malice, God wants him to live by miracle and he wants us to live by miracle. He doesn't want us to die through malice. Wow. They would put Lazarus to death, these Pharisees. They would put him to death and challenge the almighty power to raise him up again maybe as if they could contend or fight with the God of Lazarus. Many contend with him. They kick against the pricks for you Bible scholars. Many contend with him. Many fight with him. You can't fight with God. If he's got a plan for your life, a program for your life to use your gifts and abilities, if he's got something going on, no. If you've got something bad going on in your life, he knows. And you know that he knows and you continue anyway. You're as bad as the Pharisees. Challenging God. You can't fight with God and win. Hmm. There's a verse, kind of obscure, hardly ever gets, hardly ever gets uh, brought out, but 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But even, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, to the unsaved. If it be hid, and they don't, and it is, There's more people in our nation 
that don't believe in the Word of God, the Bible, never even heard it. And there, there, there is a church, actually, a Bible church they call themselves, I think it was Bible, that their claim to fame is that they preach that the Bible is not the Word of God. That it's just a collection of teachings and writings. And that's what's going to happen. You watch. You watch in the next months and years later that they're going to do everything they can to disclaim the word of God. Please believe me. The Bible is the word of God. Yes, it is. Honor it as God's word in your life. The next part of that verse, but even if the gospel is is hidden, it is hidden to those that are perishing. The next part of that verse, verse four, whose minds, the lost, whose minds, in whom the God of this world was blinded, has blinded the minds of them which believe not. The God of this world is Satan. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. Of Christ who is the image of God. Should shine on them. As the musicians come would you bow your heads with me. Who best in this story resembles you in your life? Mary, the servant. Mary, the servant of God. Martha, the sister who serves God in another way by being a, the waiter of tables. Who best describes you? The Pharisees who have their own way and refuse to budge even in the face of a man being raised from the dead or in the face of a man going to be raised from the dead. Lord Jesus Christ, there may be someone here, here or there, Lord, that this message might have spoken to them. Lord, I just pray with all my heart, all my heart, Lord, I pray for these, Lord, who need you in their life, lead more, need more of you in their life, that they're not settling for what's the least they have to do, but what's the most they could do for you. Lord, I put this calling out to these. What could they do more? What could they do more for you? Lord, I pray and I picture us all at the feet of Jesus, anointing his feet with the oil of our love, a generous love, a believing love, asking you, Lord, to touch our hearts, receive the oil from our our hearts, Lord. What a God you are. What a Savior. The inevitabilities, Lord, of life that are coming upon us in our very world. Who could have believed it just several years ago? Lord, you're working. Help us, Lord, to work as well, to be useful to you, Lord. Lord, if there's someone here that is not absolutely sure, Lord, that they're servants of God. Maybe today they want to be. Maybe today they they want to volunteer their hearts and lives and their their gifts to you. Lord, I I ask them, Lord, that right now, in the solace of this moment, to crack open the door of their heart, to let more of you in, to let more of you into their heart and life. 
Lord Jesus, you know. You know what would hold us back from completely surrendering to you. Lord, deal with that now in our hearts, in our lives. Those bad practices we don't want to give up. Those bad people we don't want to give up. Using your Holy Spirit, touch our hearts and lives and let us see the importance of giving over our heart and life to you. They might say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I've done bad things. Maybe I'm doing bad things. But Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Give me strength to overcome it. Your strength, not mine. And come into my heart. Come into my life. Take it over, Lord. I give it completely into your hands. My life into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen.